We sail northwest up into the Pacific and leave New Zealand behind. In a few days, we're in the Coral Sea and passing the Solomon Islands. And then, away to port, I see the volcanoes off the coast of New Guinea slip tantalizingly past. Eight days out, we cross a calm equator. In no time, we're among the 7,000 islands of the Philippines, passing through the busy strait with the beautiful name, San Bernardino, and sailing on up into the China Sea. 14 days after leaving Auckland, our house flag goes aloft. The flag of the Republic of the Philippines follows, and we've arrived in Manila Bay. We'd forgotten until we step ashore that Manila used to be Spanish, but the influence is unmistakable in some of the architecture. Spanish, that is, with a touch of something else. Unfortunately, most of these buildings were destroyed during the last war. The new architecture is vigorous, beautiful, and perfectly suited to climate and city. An extraordinary city, where recently two women were burnt as witches, and pirates boarded a ship in the harbor and made off with the cargo. Yes, Manila's a city of contrasts. Round the corner are very different streets and other forms of transport. Squatters' shacks of the city's poor are crowded together alongside railway lines and waterways. And everywhere there are children. Out from the city, we see our first Carabao. These water buffaloes are the rice farmer's most valuable possessions. They treat them well and try to keep them wet and cool as they prepare the paddy fields. The days fall into a cycle of plowing and planting, for on a good rice crop depends the life of these people. We return to Manila to find the ship has moved into the wharf. In this busy port, sometimes as many as 30 ships lie in the bay awaiting a berth. Apples from Hastings come out of the temperature-controlled hold into the bright manila sun. We find small, quick men have swarmed below and are unloading milk powder in two 12-hour shifts. We send half a million bags a year to factories in the Philippines, and they process it in various ways and sell it under many labels. It was like being at home with New Zealand products in the supermarkets. And this, of course, was what we'd come to see. There's a great demand for our meat. And here it's frozen hard. Can't understand, but I bet she's saying, now, butcher, are you sure that's a really nice piece? From New Zealand, naturally, it's sure to be. Some of the apples we unloaded yesterday. The cash counters supervised by an efficient looking guard, the well armed. You have to get used to this in Manila. There are guards outside the supermarket, in fact, on duty outside most commercial buildings. Somebody's obviously frightened of something, but we could never actually discover what. Residents of one of the better parts of town also employ guards to check cars entering their suburb. We feel like criminals, but only want to see some of the houses. The homes of our customers in the Philippines with their four and five car garages look like Hollywood stage sets, but they are solid and real and lived in. 
the contrast between the very rich and the very poor, with nothing much in between, is our last impression of Manila, as we get back to the bay and find the ship is preparing to sail. We unloaded a thousand tons in the three days we were in the Philippines, and we carry a further 4,000 for ports further north. Tides, currents and winds are ever-present variables. The ship's position is checked and plotted continually on the charts, and the fuel consumption and speed recorded. We leave the islands and head north towards China. 300 miles from the coast, the color of the water dramatically changes as the Yangtze Kiang sweeps out to meet the sea. In a few hours, we're looking down from the roof of a tall hotel onto a famous waterfront, the Bund of Shanghai. From this distance, Shanghai looks much as it probably did before what they call here the liberation. The public transport's good. The big articulated buses are driven by women, we notice. But there don't seem to be many cars about. And one traffic cop really doesn't seem to have anything to do at all. Foreigners a few too and we cause something of a sensation wherever we go. Today is May Day, and although there's no procession, red and white banners are everywhere. We ask what the signs say and are told, unite against American imperialism, and American aggression must be stopped. Nearly every street in the city has been planted with trees, and so are the country roads leading to one of the people's communes outside Shanghai. In this particular commune, there are nearly 5,000 households, about 20,000 people who work together on the land. Fertilizer, we notice, is transported in Alibaba-type jars. Everybody seems to be working, although we did come across some boys training under a tree. We ask if we can take pictures of this too, and to our great surprise, the answer is yes. They seem quite convinced that China is going to be invaded. The whole area is very efficiently irrigated. The crops here are barley, wheat, cotton and vegetables. We're told that there are 4,000 acres in this commune and that there are 197 communes in the rural areas around Shanghai. Back at the wharves, the ships discharged 3,000 tons of tallow and now is unloading New Zealand wool for the looms of China. Two bales are compressed together before shipping to save space. They go off to a state-owned mill and the next time we see wool from the wire wrapper, it's in a department store in one of the main streets. At the wool counter, men seem to outnumber women for some reason. The ground floor is packed, it's a holiday, and escalators are sliding people up to the higher floors. Shoppers, we notice, produce the usual snips of material they're trying to match for colour. Twelve 
miles out from the city is a park. This area used to be the Shanghai Golf Club. On a holiday like today, as many as 60,000 people come here to play and picnic. It amused me to see that although a small charge is made for admission, children under 1.2 meters high are free. If you could walk under the gate, you get in for nothing. Seems a sensible idea to me. There are some 750 million people in China, and we couldn't help thinking as we left what a lot of wool they could use if they could get it. Ships sailing under our flag drop anchor in harbors and ports with names as, as romantic as the Orient itself. Nagoya, Guam, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Kagoshima. And they bring to them the products of our farms. Mercantile ships plying back and forth across the oceans of the world trace out the pattern of a country's prosperity. We sail on into Tonghai, or the Eastern Sea. We've goods for Japan, and as the log clocks up the miles, our radar probes out among the islands as we near the coast of the cherry blossom land. The season is nearly over, but I saw one cherry blossom tree out in the countryside of terraced fields and hillsides of feathery bamboo. Again, land is scarce and the plot small, but an adaptable power unit is used as a plough, a trailer, a scooter, in fact, at everything, even a water buffalo. Millions of farmers make up 45% of Japan's population, and the average holdings about two acres. We're surprised to learn from one farmer that she is fertilizing her cabbages, or are they lettuces, with bone meal, which came originally from Southland. Brightly colored fish swim in the wind. These are to celebrate the annual boys' festival. Families fly the silken carp to ensure that their sons grow strong like the fish and successfully fight their way up the river of life. Japan's a curious mixture of modern sophistication and old traditions. People still attach fortune papers to trees in the compounds of the temples and shrines. There are beautiful temples and shrines throughout Japan. There are 1,700 of them in Kyoto alone. And the courtyards are thronged with people. The Japanese are inveterate sightseers, and they must expose more film than the rest of the world put together. As you near a shrine, the click of cameras can be heard half a mile away. Most of the shrines are set in magnificent gardens. The Japanese have a great love of gardens, but few, if any, include flowers. But flowers, of course, are important in Japanese decoration. Most girls study ikebana, flower arranging. There are several schools of flower arranging. The tall vase style is called nageri, and arrangements like this, done in a low bowl with piled up flowers, are known as moribana. The 
trunks and branches of these bonsai, or miniature trees, look as if they were hundreds of years old. And actually they are, about 200. The Japanese love their trees. If they get cold, they're wrapped up and warmed. If they're sick, they're fussed over and fed. I wish we'd line a new suburban street with trees and shrubs even before it's paved. Trees are planted on sections before they're offered for sale too. For who, after all, would buy a section without a tree? Trees surround the Imperial Palace, isolated and remote at the very heart of Tokyo. These feudal walls were built in 1450, but the besieging horde they hold back today is an army of automobiles that war and skirmish around the home of the Emperor. We went to the Ginza and watched the flood tide of people and vehicles. The older people still cling to the traditional ways, but the younger generations are becoming more westernized every year. Above the city rises the spindly-legged Tokyo Tower, higher but not nearly as elegant as the one in Paris. From the tower we look out over the biggest city in the world, which stretches away into the smog in all directions. Tokyo, the home of ten and a half million souls. We brought 250 tons of tallow with us from Auckland, most of it stowed on deck. Stern-looking port workers soon have it sailing over the side, in spite of a drizzle of rain. Some of this tallow ended up in a soap factory in the suburbs of Tokyo. On the packing floor, which smells like an acre of lilies of the valley, we watched deft fingers and machines wrapping tons of pearly-looking toilet soap. In another, quite different factory, smelling this time like mutton stew, the packing department is handling sausages made up from New Zealand mutton. Japanese homes are not built or equipped with a stove to roast or bake or grill, and meat is generally broiled. Our mutton is minced and mixed with other meats, flavouring, herbs and spices, and goes to market in all manner of attractive looking sausages, which the housewife can deal with. In still another factory, cheese we brought from Taranaki is being unpacked. The 60 pound blocks are first shredded. Next, the cheese is emulsified and blended with onion, caraway seed and other strong flavours. This is the way the Japanese like their cheese. These processed foods find their way into the supermarkets, which look much the same all over the world. With certain little differences. And guess what's displayed in the deep freeze cabinets? Japan takes about 40,000 tons of our mutton a year. Now that will be going into a Western-style house. Japan is changing fast. As a more Western diet is replacing the traditional one, predominantly rice, statistics show the race is becoming sturdier and taller. The average height has increased by as much as two inches in the last 30 years. Lunch is supplied in some schools to improve health and encourage new eating habits. We see children enthusiastically eating oranges, bread and New Zealand mutton.
Yes, Japan is changing all right. And our last impression is of a thrusting industrial nation with trade and commerce as active and varied as the neons which flash their frantic messages all through the night along the Ginza. sooner back at sea than we're changing course to avoid Typhoon Ada, which is racing up from the Philippines. But in a couple of days, we're spinning out the miles across a calm sea and heading southwest towards the China coast again. The next is to be our last port of discharge, and dark-eyed men will soon be transferring the cargo remaining in our holds into their busy slings. The agents are advised of our arrival time, and then we drop our anchor in one of the most spectacular harbours in the world. The British Crown Colony of Hong Kong is crowded onto a tiny piece of the Chinese mainland and the small adjacent islands. Most ships are moored at buoys and are discharged and loaded out in the harbour. A strange assortment of vessels receive the cargoes, junks, barges, sampans, even walla wallas. varied freight to this great free port, the hub of the Orient. Meat, butter, wool, tallow, our usual exports. But as well, venison, felt, frozen vegetables, leather, carpets, and even deer antlers. Out go the bales and boxes and bags, and soon the barges are scuttling across the harbour, delivering them to waiting customers. Milk powder goes to processing plants which take 10,000 bags a year. The powder goes in one end and comes out the other as sterilized bottled milk. There's no room in Hong Kong, of course, to keep cows, and it's difficult to get milk down across the border from China, even if they keep cows up there. They deliver some milk, we notice, in neat triangular paper containers. In the markets, we see our apples, considered a great luxury in this land where they can't be grown. A lot of food for the colony comes from the Northern Territories. Here, there's room to produce it, but there are three and a half million people in Hong Kong, and they take a lot of feeding. So do the ducks and we're delighted to find that these are enjoying a meal of New Zealand meal. Fish farms pattern the landscape up near the border. This side of the river is British Hong Kong. Beyond lies communist China. Across this border and from the sea, a million people have crossed from China into Hong Kong since 1949. A tremendous building program has been undertaken by the government in an attempt to house all these extra souls crowding into the already crowded colony. Bamboo scaffolding lattices great blocks of flats. They told us one can be built in 16 weeks and that each houses 2,300 people. Every room in these blocks accommodates a family of three to ten adults and rents range from three shillings to nine and fivepence a week. If we think these apartments are crowded, the tenants think they're luxurious. And they are. 
compared with the shacks they came from. Thousands still live in dreadful squalor, perched precariously on steep hillsides without drainage, sanitation or water. Seeing the children here makes us realize how fortunate ours are back in New Zealand. Other Hong Kong youngsters never leave the typhoon shelters, but float through life crammed together on sampans, where vacant water is easier to find than vacant land. Just around the corner, the tempo of life is very different. Here we find the hurry, hurry of a big metropolis. People, cars, buses, trams, all moving relentlessly about their urgent business. Eighty-eight licensed banks of 15 nations operate in Hong Kong, which is the international clearinghouse for the Far East and Southeast Asia. And it's through these banks that China trades with the Western world. But it's in the smaller streets and byways that we think we found the true Hong Kong. In the markets, there are sights and smells and sounds that are strange and exciting. Colors and customs and people at every turn that are continually interesting. In one small street, there's a neat little shop that imports some of its stock straight from our country. Among the aphrodisiacs on sale are antlers from young deer that roam the Canterbury High Country. You can buy them ground to powder for £7.10 an ounce. Everywhere in the East today, living standards are rising. And as the influence of the West becomes stronger in these countries, traditional habits and customs are changing. And up here, near at hand, live one quarter of the human race. 900 million customers. Voyage number one north is over, and the ship throbs to life once more. As our bow swings round and points to home, we realize that an important part of our future prosperity is back there in the countries now slipping away behind us in the retreating miles.